lately, when I'm in coaching sessions, I've been noticing a few common mistakes that many executives make. Sometimes it's a bad habit. Sometimes it's just not knowing better. It almost always negatively impacts their credibility. Fortunately, there are quick fixes that can significantly improve their communication effectiveness and ultimately boost their credibility. So I thought it might make for an impactful episode if I shared with you five quick fixes to boost your communication effectiveness. Are you curious what they are? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's talk about talk. Welcome to Talk About Talk podcast episode number 154, quick fixes to boost your communication effectiveness. Yes, this is going to be a productive episode. In case we haven't met, my name is Dr. Andrea Wojnicki and I'm your communication coach. Please just call me Andrea. I'm the founder of Talk About Talk, where I coach communication skills to ambitious executives like you to elevate your communication and your confidence so you can establish credibility and ultimately accomplish your career goals. If you go to the talkabouttalk.com website, you'll find many resources there to help you out. There's information on -on one-on-one coaching, online courses, boot camps, corporate workshops, keynotes, the archive of this bi-weekly podcast, and I really hope you'll sign up for the Talk About Talk newsletter. That newsletter is your chance to get free communication coaching from me. This is going to be a relatively short episode but it's gonna be valuable. I encourage you to think about which one or two of these five things where you can get the most traction to improve your communication. I encourage you to listen carefully to the definitions, the examples, the stories, and the solutions that I'm gonna list for you here. Don't worry about taking notes, as always. I do that for you. I'm gonna summarize what the five points are at the very end, and I encourage you to go to the talkabouttalk.com website where you can access the full transcript of this episode. Are you ready? All right, let's do this. The first quick fix that I recommend is this. Avoid upspeak. Upspeak is the habit of ending sentences with a rising intonation, as if posing a question, kind of like this. It's a common feature among many speakers, particularly women and younger individuals, but not exclusive to them. Recently, I've noticed an uptick in upspeak. Yeah, I got that. Uptick in upspeak. It's like upspeak might be a trend, but this is not a trend you want to join. You don't want to sound like you're asking a question if it's not a question, because that makes you sound like you're unsure of yourself, like you're seeking validation. This is not how credible leaders sound. If you're not sure whether you use upspeak, I have three suggestions for how you might diagnose yourself. First, ask a trusted friend or maybe your boss. You could say, I just learned about upspeak. Do you know what that is? And then... Do you ever hear me using upspeak? The second suggestion is to record yourself in a meeting and then listen very carefully, specifically to your intonation. The third suggestion is to create a transcript of a meeting when you talk a lot and then search the transcript for question marks. Because here's the thing. If the AI that created the transcript thinks you're asking a question, then chances are us humans are also catching your upspeak. Interestingly, With all of the executives with whom I've mentioned Upspeak, none of them had ever heard of this phenomenon. Then, once we talked about what it is and how it can negatively impact your credibility, 100% of them were able to at least minimize, if not completely avoid Upspeak altogether. That is a very high cure rate, isn't it? A few years ago, one of my clients asked me to meet with each of his direct reports and give them a one-on-one coaching session on their communication. I remember he told me that he was particularly excited about the potential of one of his latest recruits, a recent university graduate who was valedictorian of her class, and she was wickedly smart and ambitious, so huge potential. However, he was concerned that she didn't come across as professional as she should. When I met her in our one-on-one coaching session, one of the first things that I diagnosed with her was guess what? Upspeak. I asked her whether she knew what it was and she said no. I remember when I was explaining to her what upspeak is and how it diminishes our credibility, instead of being defensive, she was curious and obviously committed to stopping this thing called upspeak. Given her growth mindset and her ambition, that is exactly 
what she did. So now, several years later, when I meet with this senior client, he raves about her transformation in terms of her new executive presence. Avoiding upspeak can make a massive difference, literally in your tone and generally in your credibility. Upspeak was also one of the first things that I mentioned recently when I was coaching another future leader. His boss sent him to me for a series of coaching sessions to prepare him for a big promotion. After immediately diagnosing Upspeak once again, this client similarly admitted that he didn't know what Upspeak was. After I explained what it was and how it diminishes our credibility, he told me that he was committed to stop it. But then he asked me, how do I do this? How do I remind myself to stop using it? So we brainstormed for a while and here's what we came up with. He wrote it down on a piece of paper on a, like a little post-it note, a big question mark in felt marker, and then he put an X through it. So this was a signal to him, question marks, unnecessary rising in the intonation of your voice, up speak is not allowed. And he put this post-it note on the side of his laptop to remind himself whether he was in a face-to-face -face meeting or online to avoid using up speak. Guess what? It worked. In our second coaching session, I noticed that he, his upspeak had significantly declined. I only had to remind him a few times. By our third coaching session, his upspeak was completely eliminated. And at that point, he also got rid of the post-it note. I've got more stories, but you get the idea. Based on my experience coaching folks on upspeak, it seems there is an easy fix with and a big upside in terms of your perceived credibility by avoiding upspeak. Got it? Now onto the second easy fix. Make eye contact. Not establishing eye contact is, in my experience, even more common than upspeak. Managers of all levels sometimes have a habit of looking around the room, or if they're thinking about something and they feel like they're on the hot seat, they sometimes look up like they're looking into their brain. But here's the thing. You know what you're saying. You don't need to look into your brain. You know that saying, eye to eye, as in we see each other eye to eye, we trust people who make eye contact with us. And when we like people more, we're more likely to make eye contact with them for a longer period of time. So think about the negative signal that you're making when you avoid eye contact. Recently, I was coaching a senior banking executive who told me that she's conscious of the fact that she sometimes avoids eye contact. And instead, she looks up at the ceiling. She told me that she feels as if she's looking into her brain. This is her almost involuntary response when she's thinking deeply about what she wants to say. I saw her do this a few times when we were meeting and I suggested to her that, hey, you are smart enough to still be able to think without physically looking into your brain. We had a good laugh about that and she started practicing. And guess what? She was able to significantly improve her eye contact. I'm not talking about staring into someone's eyes for an uncomfortable length of time. That's just creepy. I am talking about looking at the person instead of looking around the room. When you're in person, especially if you're seated around a meeting table or a boardroom table, try to make sure that your chairs are all at the same level. You don't want to be seated above everyone on a pedestal, and you certainly don't want to be sitting lower than everyone else. You want to see people eye to eye. I get this question a lot in terms of online meetings as well. Is it important to stare directly at the camera? This is something that we've all had to work on in the early days of the pandemic when we were all working at home all the time, staring at our screens. Here's my updated take on this question of staring at the camera. It's okay. And in fact, it's a good thing to look around the screen so you can see the expressions and the body language of the people that you're meeting with. And by now, We've been doing this for long enough that we know when you're not looking exactly at the camera, you're probably looking at us. So don't worry about that. As I said, whether it's in person or online, it's important to scan the room for body language and facial expressions. However, and this is the main point here, when you are making your most important contribution, your main point, when you're making a final recommendation, when someone asks you what you think, look directly and consciously into the camera. People will non-consciously perceive that you're looking at them in the eye and that you can be trusted. Okay, so that's the second easy fix, establishing eye contact. The first one was avoiding up speak, and the second is establishing eye contact. 
The third easy fix is communicating with precision. Communicating with precision. Of all five of the easy fixes that I'm listing here, this is the one that senior executives most often seek improvement on. Let me tell you what I share with these senior executives. First of all, I say, give yourself a break. The reason you might not be communicating with precision is simply that you're being generous. You're trying to share everything that you're thinking about a topic with your audience or with the people with whom you're communicating. However, if you really wanna be generous and effective, you need to do the work to focus your message. You know the saying, if you try to share everything, they will absorb nothing. However, if you communicate one main point, your audience will understand exactly what your message is. So think about that one key message. Every time you write an email, every time you run a meeting, every time you give a speech. Once you yourself are clear on your main message, I suggest whether your communication is written, say in an email, or whether it's verbal, start with your headline. Think about the online articles that you read and those that you choose not to read and the significance of the headline. Do that favor for your audience. If you're writing an email, you can be perfectly explicit about this. Start off the email by saying, the purpose of my email, and then tell them. Then get into the details. If you're leading a meeting, or maybe you're delivering an important speech, make sure you start with the headline. Then connect everything else back to the main message. If you're introducing yourself in a professional setting, you state your name, your title, your firm, and then ideally you identify something important about yourself, your expertise or your value or your role in the meeting that's about to take place. This is you creating your own personal headline. So headlines are a key way to help you make sure that you communicate with precision. Headlines keep us focused and they ensure that the audience knows exactly what's to come. As you may have heard me say, no one gets on a bus unless they know where it's headed. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? Tell them where the bus is headed. Share your headline. Another tactic to help you communicate with precision is to use, guess what? The power of three. This is one of my favorites. If you've listened to a few Talk About Talk podcasts, you probably know I'm a huge fan of the power of three. Three is enough to be substantive, but it's not overwhelming. And that overwhelming point is important here in our focus on communicating with precision. Depending on what your objective is, you might be able to very effectively combine this idea of starting with a headline along with the power of three. How do you do that? Well, let me share a few examples on how this might work. Imagine you're walking into a job interview and the interviewer starts by asking you to share a little bit about yourself. How the heck are you going to answer that question? Here's what you do. You start with a headline and you leverage the power of three. You say something like this. My name is Katerina and I'm a human resources executive at a pharmaceutical firm. Three things that differentiate me relative to other pharmaceutical executives are A, B, and C. Let me tell you what I mean by those things. Then you elaborate on A, then you elaborate on B, and then you elaborate on C. The advantage of this strategy of starting with a headline and then leveraging the power of three is that the person who's listening knows exactly how many points you're going to make. It's like you're providing them with a roadmap of your answer to their question. Here's another example. Say you're in a meeting and you're asked, what do you think we should do? Option A or option B? Everyone turns to you and you know that you're in the hot seat. How do you answer this question? Again, start with your headline and then leverage the power of three. You could say something like this. Well, there are certainly advantages and disadvantages for both. Otherwise, this would be an easy answer. But based on my experience in working with other clients in similar challenges, I think we should go with option B. There are three main reasons for this. Then you briefly summarize. Reason one, reason two, and reason three. Boom. When we practice these types of statements in my coaching sessions with my clients, sometimes they ask me, what if I can't think of three things? My answer to them is this, you are smart enough. You are always gonna come up. You are always gonna be able to come up with three things. Even if you don't have them top of mind when you say, let me provide you with three reasons or three things, you will be able to come up with a third thing when you're talking, I promise. Okay, 
So that's the third easy fix, communicating with precision. Try using headlines and leveraging the power of three. Got it? So now we've covered avoiding up speak, establishing eye contact, and communicating with precision. The fourth easy fix is this, focusing on the other. As human beings, you could say that we're all sort of self-absorbed. We're really focused on ourselves most of the time, aren't we? But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Part of it is self-awareness. Self-awareness is really important. And if we weren't thinking about ourselves, we might not survive and we certainly would not thrive. However, focusing on others can elevate our communication and our general effectiveness. Focusing on the other is about being empathetic. This is about listening to the words, but also the subtext, the tone, the body language, and the facial expressions of others. Stop thinking about yourself for a moment. This is about being genuinely curious about what others think and believing that they will add value. I have two suggestions for you for how to do this. The first suggestion is to be conscious of your pronouns. I'm not talking about gender pronouns here, not she, her, he, him, they pronouns. I'm talking about whether your pronouns are focused on you or on other people. Ask yourself, how often do, say, do I say I? How often do I say we? How often do I say you? I coached a gentleman a while ago who unfortunately had the reputation of being self-absorbed. I encouraged him, no, I stated point blank that my recommendation to him was that he stop saying I and start saying we and you as much as possible. He got the message. Another place to check your pronouns is your emails. Personally, whenever I write an email, I always look at the first word of every paragraph to make sure that I'm not being repetitive and I'm not focusing on only what I want and what I need. If every single paragraph starts with I, that's not good. So that's my first suggestion. Watch your pronouns. The second suggestion is to ask questions. Ask lots and lots of questions. If you're asking questions, then you're not just focusing on yourself, are you? You're focusing on what other people think and what they say. The third suggestion is to track the ratio. Track the ratio of you speaking versus other speaking in the room. Be mindful of your talk to listen ratio. Make sure that you're speaking at or even below your fair share. If there's only one other person with whom you're communicating, make sure you're speaking less than 50% of the time. If there's five people in the room, make sure you're speaking less than 20% of the time. You get the idea. Be other focused. Okay, so that's the fourth quick fix. Be other focused. On to the last one. Control your narrative. This is probably the least quick of the five quick fixes that I've listed here, but it's really, really important. Controlling your narrative is about carefully, strategically choosing the words and the phrases that you use, especially about yourself. Here's the thing. The words coming out of your mouth about yourself are the most direct way that you reinforce your personal brand. It's explicit because it's words and they're coming out of your mouth. This may be the most credible, most objective, most direct way for people to assess who you are. An obvious example of this comes up in terms of controlling your narrative when you're introducing yourself. Controlling your narrative is not about creating an elevator speech about yourself. It is about consciously considering the words and the phrases that you want to reinforce about yourself. For example, many of the folks that I coach are leaders or aspiring leaders. So I encourage them to use the word leader, lead, led as much as they can. You might introduce yourself as I lead the ABC company, or you might say in that meeting that I led last week, you get the idea. This is controlling your narrative. Another context when you might control your narrative is when you're making a point in a meeting or sharing an opinion. Here's what I encourage my clients to do. Preface your recommendation or your opinion with a statement about your valuable experience or expertise. Here's an example. Imagine you're in a meeting with your team trying to decide whether to go with option A or option B again, right? Instead of saying, I think we should go with option A, take a step back and say, based on my experience in banking or 
based on my expertise and focus on strategy and marketing, or based on the success of our team's previous client engagement, you get the idea. You're reinforcing your expertise or your success by sharing where your input is coming from. This is controlling your narrative. A great example that I have for controlling your narrative came from a Q&A that I did a few years ago where a lawyer in New York talked about how tired she was of being known as an immigrant. Her brand, she said, was that of an immigrant. Yes, she was an immigrant from India. So I asked her, you're a lawyer in New York? Yep, in Manhattan, she said. What kind of law? Corporate. Okay, I said to her, you're going to stop saying the word immigrant. You need to take control of your narrative. Replace immigrant with global experience. And here's the thing. Your accent is simply a reminder to all of us of your global experience. Here's your new narrative. I'm a corporate lawyer in Manhattan with global experience. Yeah, she was pretty happy with that new narrative, let me tell you. So now I'm asking you, what is there about your valuable experience, about your unique perspective that you can use to similarly fuel your own narrative? And that is the fifth of the five quick fixes to boost your communication effectiveness. Do you remember what they are? The five quick fixes to boost your communication effectiveness are number one, avoid upspeak. Number two, establish eye contact. Number three, focus on the other. Number four, communicate with precision. And number five, control your narrative. Now, here's your challenge. Take out a sheet of paper and write down these five quick fixes. Then ask yourself, in which one of these areas am I most efficient? Where is there opportunity? And where can I get traction? Then double down, implement the quick fix and boost your communication effectiveness. If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll share it with your friends who could also benefit from some quick fixes to boost their own communication effectiveness. You could also leave me a review on whatever podcast app you're using. It really makes a difference and I appreciate it very much. Don't forget to sign up for my free communication coaching newsletter on the talkabouttalk.com website. Thanks for listening and talk soon.